I just know lately, like, I don't know, since I've started lecturing more, I don't know, since the pandemic, I've just been like, I don't know. Like, oh. I'm grateful that you were here. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to our fall 2022 lecture series. As part of the 100th anniversary year of Catholic Chaplaincy at Yale, our speakers were invited to address topics that will likely impact the church going into the future. There are note cards and pens on your tables, and I encourage you to write down questions you have throughout the lecture. They'll be picked up at the end of the presentation for a Q&A session at the end. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Craig Ford back to STM to give the Reverend Richard R. Russell Lecture in Theology. Dr. Ford com completed his Bachelor of Arts in Theology and Philosophy from Notre Dame University. He received his Master of Arts in Religion at Yale Divinity School in 2013 and his PhD in Theological Ethics from Boston College in 2018. For Dr. Ford, coming to STM is a homecoming as he studied in the Golden Center and regularly attended lectures here as a student. Dr. Ford is currently serving as an assistant professor in the Theology and Religious Studies Department at St. Norbert College. He also teaches at the Institute of Black Catholic Studies at Xavier University in Louisiana during the summers. This past summer, Dr. Ford received the Catherine Mowry Lacuna Award for New Scholars from the Catholic Theological Society of America for his scholarship on LGBTQ and black moral theology. Tonight, Dr. Ford will be addressing the topic, racism, homophobia, transphobia, and the Roman Catholic Church. And with that, please help me to welcome him. Good evening, everyone. I, are you able, do you still have that on your, you can, I don't know why this was. I'm not sure why I can't see. Sorry. This is exactly how I pictured starting the lecture, by the way. <laughs> like, nervous, and then the, th the thing goes out. Uh, I'll it was just on. It's on on my screen. And then, okay. And now we will have Now we'll start. It's good. Thank you. It is a true honor to be here. As Sister Jen said, um, it, there is something uh, surreal about being invited to give a lecture that you attended when you were here. And it's even um, more of a daunting topic when I sat down to write this you know, lecture, when I chose three of the most divisive issues in the world and said, Sister Jen, how long am I talking for tonight? And she was like, we're done in an hour. And I was like, well, I'm going to have this done and talk about the next 100 years in 40 minutes so and leave time for questions and discussion. But really, that's what I see as the heart of this. Um, really being able to talk with each other about these complex issues and seeing what light can be shed on them from our conversation. So you may be surprised to find that even though these are immensely big issues in the church, racism, homophobia, and transphobia, I actually think the most important thing for us to think about as a church right now is the fact that there are fewer and fewer people who identify as Christians. That actually, perhaps one of the biggest crises in the US church right now are the rise of those who are religiously unaffiliated. The Pew Research Center has been doing a number of really important and enlightening studies about the composition, the religious composition of the United States. Right now, or as of last December, 63% of U.S. adults identified as Christian, 29% said they didn't have any religion, and 6% were adherents of non-Christian religions. 
Those numbers may not seem as striking until you place them in a bit of historical perspective. If you ask a 15-year-old, well, they might not be able to answer this question, actually, but if you looked at the lifespan that they've had, there has been a dramatic shift in religious affiliation given their age. In 2007, Christians outnumbered the nuns, that is, people who have no religious affiliation, by almost five to one. Today, Christians outnumber the nuns by little more than two to one. So that's just within 15 years. And five days ago, the Pew Research Center offered another study trying to predict what this will look like in the next 40, 50 years. This is what they said on Monday. If we stay on our current trajectory, and by trajectory I mean religious affiliation given the phenomenon of switching, which is something that many people do when they're in the exact age group that many college students are in. Between 15 and 30 people, approximately 31% of Christians switch out of Christianity to something, and a relatively, or at least you get a lower number of people switching in from the nuns back into Christianity. On our current trajectory though, Christians will most likely make up less than 50% of the population in any scenario where young people continue to switch out at their current rate. And at its most severe, this projection stated that Christians will make up about 35% of the population in 2070. What to me is striking about this data is the question, why? Why are people leaving? And when you ask people why they're leaving, the answers that researchers and sociologists give you is a lot of reasons. Some of them I want to list and just talk about briefly. Some people mention this phenomenon that researchers call existential security. What this basically is, is a theory that as societal conditions improve and as scientific advancements allow for people to live longer lives, they have fewer worries about meeting basic needs and thus have less need for religion to cope with the troubles that they have in their lives. That's one reason why scientists think people may be leaving. In the 90s, um, there was a precipitous drop in religious affiliation, and so some scientists find that to be particularly important because it was at that time where many people began to solidify in their minds an association between Christianity on the one hand and conservative politics on the other. And so that led to the um, departure of many people who might have identified as liberal or progressive Christians. So that's one other reason. A third is just a general decline in trust in religious institution, the most, I think, important of which for us in the Catholic context has been the clergy sex abuse scandal and how many people see that scandal as not properly resolved and in many cases, trust not yet restored among the people who are part of this community. And then another one is that people are just living in more inter-religious households and thus find affiliation with one particular religion less, um, less uh, appealing. And so these are some of the hypotheses. But then I also want to note some of the experiences that people have had. So Eliza Campbell is a queer woman who left the Church of Latter-day Saints at about the age of 20. And she said, for me, especially, when I started to come out as queer, it became impossible for me to reconcile this church that was basically admitting that they wanted kids like me dead or suicidal. She finishes that interview saying, I decided I had to choose myself and choose my well-being. There are so many windows into why people are exiting. Maybe they're secularizing because religion served a need that they, no longer, that they no longer have. Maybe they're leaving because it doesn't fit their political viewpoint. Maybe they're leaving because they distrust institutions. Maybe they're leaving because they find that their own being in church environments seems to contribute to their mental distress. What I want to offer tonight is another vantage point onto this. I think it's difficult to determine what is the cause of people leaving. 
And so one of the things that we should focus on is the experiences of people and trying to see if by walking through and with people through their experience, we can see analogies to other experiences. And I want to start with the black Catholic experience which happens to be the tradition of Catholicism that I happen to identify with myself. And so I want this to be a lens because for black Catholics, we are also experiencing this same phenomenon. Roughly half of black adults who were raised as Catholics continue to identify as Catholic as they get older, which is less than both their white and their Hispanic counterparts. So for every two black Catholics, potentially, that I knew, one will no longer be a Catholic into their adulthood. Why is that the case? Brian Massingale, who you may know is one of the most famous black Catholic theologians in the country, he teaches at Fordham University, he calls this an exodus from the Catholic Church that is due to the fact that what, ca what black Catholics care about as a part of their faith is not shared by Catholics of other races, particularly white Catholics. As Massingale points out from, once again, another Pew study, more than 75% of black Catholics say that a commitment to racial justice is an essential or important dimension of their faith. What's really shocking is to look at the other part of that sentence when you ask our white counterparts how important that is to their faith versus only 13% of Catholics overall. Three quarters of black Catholics want and expect to hear sermons that are relevant to the distinctive struggles of black people in America. Yet less than a third of those who worship in predominantly white parishes heard sermons addressing anything around the 2020 protests and the emergence, the reemergence, the reigniting of the Black Lives Matter movement. What Massingale writes is the following. In other words, the black exodus from the Catholic Church is due to the fundamental disconnect between what the vast majority of black Catholics see as essential for understanding faith and the concerns being addressed in most white congregations. It is not the whiteness of the Catholic Church that is the issue. In fact, most black Catholics worship in predominantly white churches. Right? It is the unwillingness of the white Catholic community to engage realities that are existentially important for African American believers and black Catholics. That reality for us is racism. Confronting and dismantling the racism that we see in our society. And what makes this such an interesting prospect is that racism is actually condemned in all Catholic teaching. That if you look at the history of Catholic social teaching, particularly in the US, we have had document after document addressing the evil and the sin of racism. Most recently, the 2019 document, Open Wide Our Hearts, which highlights that racism can be both an interpersonal reality, but it can also be an institutional reality. So if we have these documents, what is the disconnect? Where is that? It's in trying to come to an answer to this question that black Catholics are finding the Catholic Church coming up short. And as a result, they're leaving. As I think about the problem of the next 100 years, the, the, many, the causes of disaffiliation, as well as the lens of the black experience on that disaffiliation, I want to offer as a conversation tonight a theory, or at least a thesis. Let's put it that way. Let's say thesis because I only have, yeah, thesis. So if we use the black Catholic lens, experience as a lens, I think we can ask ourselves whether this is true. If we want to survive as a Catholic church in the United States, we must make our church relevant to the ongoing freedom struggles taking place by marginalized communities. 
Freedom struggle is a very important term that comes out of the African American experience because it describes, not the very least, the movement in the 1950s and 60s in the Civil Rights Movement, as well as connecting that struggle to the overall struggle against slavery, Jim Crow, and our continued journey towards racial equality in the United States. For black Catholics, to stay, we need to be engaged in the freedom struggle. I think for those of us who are thinking about the church overall, this is a lens by which we may think about saving our communities, saving the numbers that we have. But I want to use freedom here in a very particular way. I want to say that we need to engage in the ongoing freedom struggles of marginalized communities using the black community as a lens, but I want to use freedom in the way that we receive it in the Second Vatican Council. So freedom in two ways. The, large, the, the document that we typically understand as highlighting freedom at the Second Vatican Council is the document Dignitatis Humanae, which is also known as the Declaration on Religious Freedom. One of the ways that freedom is understood in that document is that in order for us to come to know and to love God, we must first secure a roster of rights and freedoms within the society in which we live. So on the one hand, there's this precondition to thinking about freedom that, become, that is synonymous with having rights and freedoms. This is what they say, in, 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 this is what the bishops say in Dignitatis Humanae. All human beings are bound to adhere to the truth once it is known and to order their whole lives in accord with the demands of truth. Truth for the Catholic tradition being ultimately this relationship with God. Right? However, people cannot discharge these obligations in a manner keeping with their own nature unless they enjoy immunity from external coercion as well as psychological freedom. The document continues to talk about what this freedom looks like by assisting one another as the social creatures we are in coming to know the truth. So in Dignus Humanae, in that same, uh, Dignitatis Humanae, in that same paragraph, they'll mention that we are to aid one another with teaching and instruction, communication and dialogue in the course through which we can help each other understand the truth from the perspective that we see it. And the document continues to say that it doesn't just end with conversation, it actually ends with protection by our government for equality of citizens before the law. The quote from Dignitatis Humanae 6 reads as follows. Government is to see to it that equality of citizens before the law, which is itself an element of the common good, is never violated, whether openly or covertly, for religious reasons. Nor is there to be discrimination among citizens. The freedom that I have in mind to think about within the freedom struggle then is to come to know the truth and love God in part by honoring and respecting the human dignity that each of us has within a society. There is also a second way that, that, that freedom is talked about within Dignitatis Humanae. This one might seem more familiar to you depending on how or where you are sort of church politics. The other argument about freedom in this document is that the government must not hinder people from acting on the basis of their religious convictions in the public square, either individually or corporately. So freedom not only to have what you need in honor with your dignity, but as a part of that, being able to act on the basis of one's religious convictions in the public sphere. The bishops here write, in addition, it comes within the meaning of religious freedom that religious communities should not be prohibited from freely undertaking to show the special value of their doctrine in what concerns the organization of society and the inspiration of the whole of human activity. This places us, I think, on the direct doorstep of where racism, transphobia, and homophobia come into our consciousness. As we, if any of you are familiar with the legal cases going on around questions of hiring and firing of LGBTQ plus um, teachers, right, or even around um, complying with the contraception mandate in the Affordable Care Act, many Catholic institutions have taken exceptions to these sorts of laws on the, on the grounds, on the claim, 
that doing so or complying with these laws or doing or having a particular practice will actually work against their religious freedom that actually f restricts their ability to practice their faith as they want it. What the black Catholic experience, one of the, the insights I think of the black Catholic experience is that religious freedom in this sense, in acting the public sphere, depends on the freedoms that you have in the former sense. That the legitimacy of the church acting outside of itself depends on the internal environment of the freedoms of the people inside of it. This you might know, or we'll also go into a bit of detail, is this experience of black Catholics struggling for equality, not only within um, the society at large, but within religious communities. It wasn't until the 19th century that black women were even admitted into religious communities. Right? Um, black communities were underserved by white communities throughout United States history. The legitimacy of being able to bring our doctrine into the world for Catholics, for black Catholics, has been being true to our, to being true to the dignity of all people within that community, including people, black people, African Americans, descendants of slaves. So just to recap this really quickly, there are two senses in which freedom comes in dignitates humanae, and they both come under the realm of religious freedom. One is this element of freedom that depends on securing rights in a society and respecting each other in dialogue and enjoying freedom from coercion and any psychological distress in the search for that truth. And the other one is being able to use that truth in the public sphere. What I think the wisdom of the black Catholic tradition brings to us in this short time that we have together is recognizing that you need the first in order to be able to do the second with integrity. Okay. That was what I meant to turn to maybe about two minutes ago, but that's the same thing. Right. <laughs> When we talk about the freedom and the freedom struggle in my hypothesis about how we keep people in our Catholic communities, it is first by being the type of community where we are marked by respect for human dignity. So I want to offer three elements of the black Catholic experience that I think can help us chart some of the very troubling cultural waters we're in within, with respect to these two other freedom struggles, one around homophobia and one around transphobia. It's to look at, critically, moments in which racism has happened, has occurred in the past, and continues to happen in the present, and then saying, is there a parallel here? Now, this will not solve all of the problems that we have. If you're a skeptic of this, you might say, these are different issues. So even if there are parallels, that doesn't mean that they are exactly the same. I grant that to be true. But what I think we might find in the next few minutes is that these things that are elements of the black Catholic experience can be seen as bedrocks for engagement of any of these major issues. And that to the extent that we are lacking these elements in our conversations as a church, we will not be able to get to a resolution around transphobia and homophobia. Those three things I wanna talk about. One, going to the data. Two, regarding segregation as morally unacceptable. And three, proceeding humbly with arguments related to nature or what is natural. I think these three elements together give us a small glimpse of what our next decades as a church need to be characterized by if we want to constructively engage these seemingly intractable issues around racism, homophobia, and transphobia. So in the thesis, I said that we need to engage in the freedom struggle of marginalized communities. That often is a fight in and of itself. People say, I'm marginalized. 
my viewpoint doesn't want to be heard, therefore I'm marginalized, right? Maybe we've heard this argument before. When I hear this argument, I say, okay, if you are marginalized, we will be able to find some statistically significant trends or data that show disparate negative outcomes associated with a particular group. That is why it's so important to go to the data. Number one, it grounds us in a reality that is independent of many of the interpersonal forces that we have. Many of us think about racism as this interpersonal interaction, right? Like person A does something to person B on the basis of their race and that action disadvantages them, right? That's discrimination. That's our paradigmatic instance of race. But that's not how scholars understand racism to be at its root. That racism sits within the cultural as well as the institutional functioning of our society. What that means is that independently of any feelings that you might have about any black person or any other person of color, or any person of another race, these relationships will hold. That means that you will study it like a scientist does. What are the interesting trends that come forward when we look at race as a factor? Okay, so going to the data when we look at race shows us some of these things. One, median net worth between black and white households in the United States. One hundred and seventy one thousand in twenty twenty. For black families, that median net worth is seventeen thousand six hundred dollars. What this means in part is that black people are poor. And this poverty correlates with a number of adverse outcomes, right? Having less money means that you're unable to, in the United States, live in neighborhoods that, are, that have well-funded schools, in part because schools are connected to property values, and of course, property values are in neighborhoods, right? This sort of fact exists independently of how we might feel about racism or how I might feel about people from different races. And that's why I think it's so grounding and important to our discussions when we talk about these sorts of realities, right? When we think about transphobia and homophobia, one strategy we must engage is what is the data telling us about the experiences of these people? To give you two other pieces of data that come from just the black and white experience, right? If you look at income even, right? You have still disparity where black, black households making, are making $41,000 annually versus white households making $71,000 annually. This becomes really important when you have something like a pandemic that goes on, right? The ability to have wealth, which was the first slide that I talked about, and the ability to have income correlate well with being able to sit on Zoom for hours and hours and do your job, right? Unless you have to go into work in a supermarket or in a building, especially prior to a vaccine, right? You can see how money even spirals into other concerns around health and safety. And lastly, this one last, uh, this one last quote about the poverty line, right? Whereas fewer than one in 10 white people live below the poverty line, you can find nearly one in every five black people living below the poverty line. Let's say one in 10 and then one in five. So this data is supposed to ground us. It's supposed to ground us in the experiences of the people who are struggling for what they understand to be dignity in the society in which they live. What does that look like for LGBTQ people? This is what I want to highlight. 45% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered attempting suicide in the past year. These data are from the 2022 Trevor Project. So these are just fairly recent. 14% of LGBTQ youth attempted suicide just in the past year. And when we think about transgender boys slash men as well as transgender girls, when that number floats above and right below the 50% line. That number is really striking for me because in my mind, the same number of Catholics who leave my church is equivalent to the number of trans people who are committing suicide or attempting to commit suicide. I mean, considering attempting suicide. We know this 
independently of any other dispute that we're having, doctrinally, philosophically, whatever you happen to be doing, this, these are true despite how you feel or how anyone feels. What else do we know? We also know that LGBTQ youth in high, who felt high social support from their family reported attempting suicide at less than half the rate of those who felt low to moderate social support. Same thing similarly with uh, LGBTQ plus affirming schools as well as affirming communities. One thing that I think can chart a path for the church in the decades that are coming is to recognize these issues not as ideological issues or simply as gender and sexuality issues, but as pro-life issues. Actions which can be shown to significantly correlate with death or adverse mental health outcomes must be avoided as a part of our church's pro-life witness. That, to me, is a grounding step moving forward when thinking about these issues of racism, transphobia, and homophobia. What are the things that are leading to premature death, and how do we intervene in them? Second, a very prominent part of the black experience and the black Catholic experience is segregation. And for black, for black people, this has started not only with slavery, but continued through to Jim Crow in the South and through segregation in the North. Historians recently have been highlighting for us just how insidious the Catholic treatment, the white Catholic treatment of black people has been. In the North, for example, John McGreevy highlights and, and documents white priests going from neighborhood to neighborhood begging their parishioners not to sell their house to black people because as soon as a black family moves in, the community will leave. Right. Shannon D. Williams, in her um, book, Subversive Habits, which I understand that some of you will be reading here at the STM, highlights how black religious women, not only were they barred from going and entering religious communities to the beginning of the 19th century, but when many of them did, they took their vows in segregated churches, where black people were on one side and white people were on the other. Segregation was the strategy we used in this country, the strategy that white people used in this country to continue to keep black people out of positions and situations where they can see themselves as the equals of white people. It is a strategy, no matter how it has been thought out, as one that actually implies inferiority not separate but equal, as we have heard in past Supreme Court rulings. So it's particularly alarming to me as a black Catholic when I look at the experiences of LGBTQ plus people and trans people and find that we are using the strategy of segregation again. I mentioned before, earlier, that LGBTQ educators, particularly in secondary schools, if you're found to be in a same-sex relationship, you can lose your job like that. If you're trans, right, and you transition during your job, we have, we have court cases of trans people suing because they were kicked out of their jobs after their employers became aware of their transition. We are seeing the separation of LGBTQ plus people from Catholic spaces <coughs> in a way that resembles the way black people were kept out of Catholic spaces. One of the things that you'll read in Shane and Dee's book when you get to it here is that black Catholic women were not just joining religious orders, they were integrating them by their presence. They were the force of integration. And so when we see a pattern of segregation, we should be aware of that, how that logic is being recirculated. 
if with, black, if with the black and white race line, segregation ultimately implied inferiority for black people, we should be attentive to segregation of LGBTQ people from spaces with this, on the grounds of having the same suspicion. This is a particularly stark reality for trans people who are going to high schools or living and working in Catholic um, institutions like schools or hospitals or um, schools are generally where you're, you're seeing most of this. If you uh, have been following the news, you're probably aware that this was the summer of a um, large number of declarations from dioceses claiming that trans people in schools, these are students, adolescents, maybe even younger, these policies ensured or assured that no one could go by any pronoun or name that did not fit their biological sex. So you have transgender people who are in these institutions who no longer can be referred to by their name or using the pronouns that they associate with their own identity. For example, in the Diocese of Milwaukee, this not only refers just to pronouns, but also refers to um, uh, sorry, um, bathrooms as well as sports. And if you look at a place potentially like Marquette, Michigan, what we're seeing actually is admission to the sacraments depends upon a complete renunciation of a person's trans identity or a complete renunciation of someone publicly living in a same-sex relationship. So there are some dioceses in the United States right now that I contend are practicing a form of segregation again, where if you come into a community as trans, you cannot stay, which puts our Catholic schools in a very strange space because it means that you don't have to be Catholic to go to a Catholic school, but you definitely can't be trans. And that sort of reality is chilling to me because what it highlights is the reality that perhaps these people are less than. And some of the logic and some of the arguments that you might see people use when they talk about why these are necessary might resemble some of the same logic and anxieties that you see during racial segregation. A fear that um, if someone were to intermarry right, with someone from the opposite sex, that that would bring about a crisis in marriage. Promotion of homosexuality is often argued as bringing about a crisis in marriage. Once again, this is not conclusive. These are different moral questions. But if you see some homologous parallels, that might be something that raises your antenna and says, this might be something to pay attention to as a problem. So two bedrock observations I think are helpful for thinking about racism, transphobia, and homophobia. One right, is thinking about the data getting to the experiences of people, to get beyond the rhetoric and what you're seeing in public, to getting to the experiences that people have, and saying that we must, as a church, keep people alive and do those things that promote their life chances, not decimate them. Second one is being aware of how segregation is used as a tool to keep spaces in a certain way. The final one, is proceeding humbly with arguments about nature. So many of us who are familiar with Catholic moral arguments around homosexuality and trans identity know that at some point, a reference to what is called the natural law emerges. That sexuality is in part um, for reproduction, and so sexual activity is supposed to be used in and every instance be open to reproduction. And because same-sex sexual acts are not open to reproduction, these actions are immoral. The argument around trans identity right, is that God gives someone an identity as either male or female from their birth, even before almost. They are, they are almost what you could say, essentially their identity is essentially tied to their gender, such that changing it would be seen as unnatural. Some arguments might even say that it dishonors God or it's an act of ingratitude. In the past, arguments about 
the natural law, were also used to disadvantage black people. At the dawn of slavery, there was a question, or the dawn of shadow slavery in the United States, there was a question among white clergy about whether black people even needed to be preached to. Were they human enough to be converted? Um, there was a theory called hereditary heathenism. The idea that every generation, successive generation of black people in the country, or uh, black people that came into existence, had the same sort of biological and psychological deficiency. That argument obviously did not win the day. Slaves, in fact, became Christians and imagined a God of freedom beyond even the preaching of their white slaveholders. But laws about nature and claims about nature were used to do this. Once again, this is not an argument that disproves anything. I haven't given you that. But what I have tried to do is suggest that we have to proceed humbly with arguments about nature, in part because doing so restores us to the practice of someone whose Catholicism no one can test, Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> At the end of the day, I am a Thomas Aquinas nerd. That's what got me into grad school, and even though I do a lot of other stuff, I still enjoy reading the Summa to find out what Thomas is really interested in versus what he's just writing about because he needs to tell people about something. And you can tell after a while, if you're that nerdy, you'll, you can find that. What Thomas does when he talks about the natural law, and I love this, he uses this image from the Psalms of a divine imprint. Thomas says that the natural law is the divine imprint of God on our minds that helps us discern what is good and what is evil. And for Thomas, that does not tell you a lot about what is wrong or what is right. It tells you that you have a connection to determining what that is. Thomas says, if you want to ask a lot of complicated questions, you're going to have to do something about it. You can't just expect to download it from you know, the internet, right? which was not a thing then. Thomas says, if you want to figure out what the natural law says about any complicated moral question, you can't sidestep two very important things. One is virtue. You cannot figure out what it is to do the right thing in the natural law account of Thomas Aquinas unless you are the type of person whose life resembles moral excellence. You have to be the courageous person, the person whose life is marked by faith, hope, and love. These things are necessary to discern the natural law according to Thomas Aquinas. And the person who is best equipped to do that, the virtuous person, may run into another problem, knowledge. You can be very virtuous. I, I like to think that I am, but I know that I'm not. Uh, you can be very virtuous, but yet if you don't know what you're talking about, it's not going to help you. Thomas Aquinas' method of discerning the natural law was using this imprint of the divine light upon us to investigate the world. What made Thomas so upsetting to people, so upsetting that when he died, his books got placed on the index, or banned at least for a while, was that he integrated the latest scientific insights of the day. That was his natural law method. And he tried to find areas of understanding by looking at the human experience and then judging that in light, of course, of God's revelation. Right? That never gets sidestepped. But what Thomas wants to point out, I think, is that you must seek an integrative stance between faith and what we are learning through the use of our reason. That is what it means to proceed humbly with arguments about nature. It means that we recognize that we must be virtuous people, but we also must be people who are open to knowledge wherever it takes us. And if you find yourself in a situation 
where in order to maintain our faith, we have to push aside what we are learning from other parts of our human experience, including what our scientists, sociologists, psychologists, and people are telling us, we are actually going against the natural law tradition. We're doing something else. It was that integration, not only of virtuous people who had, among other traits, compassion on the plight of slaves that led to abolitionism, that led to a change in what happened to black people in this country. It was also continuing to learn about the human experience, that the pseudosciences that we came up with to, um, to basically de deem black people lesser by, bio by biological design, that those things were actually false. We learned more and we started to react appropriately to those things, we hope. Proceeding humbly with arguments about nature involves us doing this two-step over and over again, being the types of people animated by virtue, but also integrating with all sources of knowledge, because at the end of the day, we are seeking the truth. And the truth, as Dignitatis Humanae points out, as Thomas points out, as we hear ad nauseum in the Catholic tradition, the truth is unitary and all truth points back to God. And so we have no reason to fear any of it. So I have not gotten into the juicy, juicy moral arguments of related to race, sex, and gender. So if you signed up for that tonight, I'll have to give you a refund. Um, but what I hope I've try to stimulate in our thinking are three ground rules for future discussions of any of these phenomena. One, right, is making sure that we always highlight the data and the real experiences of people, independent of the rhetoric, independent of anything else. Two, that we are always vigilant to the reality of segregation and the pain that that always causes. And three, Recognizing that any argument that we put forward about nature must proceed with an asterisk marked by humility, virtue, and continued integration of the sources of knowledge that we have. That is what helps people achieve what I offered in the beginning as the freedom to be in society. That this goal, this is the necessary precondition for living out the religious freedom that our church is very fond of protecting. Being virtuous people, being people who are animated by justice, by making sure that everyone has those things that are necessary for being in relationship with God. And once again, I'll read those things to you, right? Um, those things are immunity from external coercion, as well as psychological freedom. There are things like being, entering into communication and dialogue, things that you cannot do if you're segregated from one another. Being able to share ideas. And the performance of rights and duties, ultimately by government, that assures equality of citizens before the law. And that there be no discrimination. These are the preconditions for the possibility of us as Catholics living out what it means to be free. And I think the legacy of black Catholics can help us begin to see new ways through these other conversations that appear from our vantage point a lot murkier. And I hope that will keep people in our church. Thank you all. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dr. Ford. Um, I'll come around and get questions from people in just a moment, but since you ended with Aquinas and as a Dominican, I have to start there. Uh, <laughs> so just thinking of, there's so much knowledge and so many sources and so many resources. How do you follow natural law now mm -hmm. without being a specialist in everything? Sure. Which, cause that's an easy thing to go down. And also, where do you start when you're seeking out that wisdom and knowledge both in terms of scientific mm. ways of knowing things and in church truths. So, cause there can sometimes be conflicts between those. So how, how do you kind of discern those two things? 
Um, can you repeat the second part of that question one more time? Sorry, I just want to make sure I got it Sure, right. yeah, just yeah. so when there's um, either conflicts or differences in terms of what you know scientifically and what you know by church truth mm -hmm. or what's being communicated both ways. So how do you discern between those two things when there's not always yeah. agreement? Yeah, um, one of the things, so I get to nerd out one more time about Thomas, so thank you, Sister Jen. So um, one of the hypotheses about the natural law is that what is, what allows for us to exhibit well-being is a good guide to discerning what may be morally good for us as well. So we live in a world where, I mean, I don't have to tell you, right? People are saying, I have my facts, you have your facts. You can find a study that says X, Y, Z. You can find a study that says A, B, C, right? So how do we sort through those sorts, those things, these competing claims within this overarching moral framework, right? Because a lot of these claims are still very much contested in the scientific world, and of course they're contested theologically. One thing that I find very helpful that comes out of Aquinas is recognizing that well-being, a creature that is doing well, is a precondition for it living morally very well. So for example, I've argued in the past that a transgender person exhibiting integration in their gender identity and their own self, under, or their gender, um, you know, how they, how they perform their gender as well as their self-understanding, that sort of integration is a sign, it's not an infallible one, but it is a sign of someone flourishing. It's impossible to be the virtuous person that Thomas wants each of us to turn into if we are fragmented in our being. So a sign of integration is actually a precursor, potentially, of living a virtuous life. Obviously, you have to ask other questions around all these other things, but um, it's a precursor to it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of competing accounts of what it means to be, you know, what is natural, what is not. I don't mean to downplay any of them. What I only mean to say by, I guess what I'm trying to highlight is that the posture of humility will also allow us to seed potentially to other people's experience as well. Like when we're in a deadlock around scientific conversation about what is adaptive and what is not or whatever we're studying, if we see people living healthy lives, that has to count for something. And that counted for something for Thomas's framework. So the question is, thoughts on where do we go from here? Okay. How do we as lay people work to make our spaces like churches or schools safe when our archdiocese might make policies against it? These are some great questions. Um, I have found that the more I learn about my own ancestors, I've learned that we are some creative Catholics. Black Catholics have had to really survive in some adverse circumstances, and it has evolved creativity. Part of that creativity is recognizing that there are teachings that come down to us that we have to, um, that, we, that we feel like we're under obligation to follow. But then the other way is interpreting how they're lived out in a context. You can have a rule that says this is what you must do, but it is always important within Catholic pastoral practice of integrating that rule in a way that leads to communities where people can have relationship with God. That principle, I think, is really important here. We're getting these diocesan um, declarations around gender identity and sexuality, and I think that creativity in response is important. How do you save the relationship? that that young person or that trans person or that queer person has with God, recognizing that we cannot have a church law that transparently in your mind as a minister, as a person, leads that person to disintegration, to out of relationship with God. That would be a perverse application of a church rule. So finding creative ways to be faithful to the teaching by highlighting the importance of building a relationship with people, 
right, that say, yeah, at our school, we understand that this is the policy. We also know that between the ages of 12 and 14, there is a July 4th version of hormones going in everyone's body. They're trying to figure out who they are and what they're doing. We want to help them. This is how we know how best to help them while also respecting the boundary of the teaching, right? I think that sort of creativity is, is, is there. Um, that's one answer. <laughs> So these two questions are very similar, actually. Okay. One is uh, thinking about a very practical issue of things like homilies. So okay. if you have, if you say something that supports Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. then it might drive white Catholics away. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you balance those two needs, the competing needs within those communities? Um, is it about numbers? What's, what's the final thing of how you decide what you preach in the pulpit and who yeah. are you trying to attract or um, maybe not attract at that point? And a similar question, uh, so in terms of segregation of LGBTQ plus individuals from Catholic institutions, there's two extremes here. So Catholic institutions rejecting same-sex relationships or on the other side, kind of endorsing them. Um, so again, is there that, what's the middle ground and how do you find that space where you're still possibly uh, carrying out Catholic moral teaching and also not necessarily endorsing same-sex relationships? Okay. Okay. What I like about Digitatis Humanae here that I, I tried to mention a few times is that part of the freedom that we need as a precondition for, for engaging a substantive relationship with God is being able to meet together and talk about the truth as we see it. In our democracy, I am sensing that that, that skill is not very well used at the moment. But in our churches, we should be using that skill all the time. Jesus, relentlessly in the Gospels, encounters people who are living in situations where they're put at the edge of their society. Should not we as Catholics be at the forefront of these conversations, right? Being aware of what the discussions are, being aware of these perspectives and having those conversations, right? So when Black Lives Matter gets said in a church, knowing the congregation, you have the staffing and the plan in place to hold a space of conflicting feelings, emotions, and sensibilities, and being able to turn that into a process of journeying together, right? I do think it's important that we have solidarity with marginalized groups, obviously from this presentation, but how we implement that is always important. In a white community that may not believe that Black Lives Matter is something that Catholics can say, if we do say it, or if we bring a speaker that says it, then, we in the community take responsibility for having a conversation about why this is that way and, in, and talking to one another about these things. I think that is how we get to know what sort of content should go in the homily, what will help lead the community to the next step, right? Sometimes knowing that we don't know what the next step is, but we want to hold space for multiple positions because we have just encountered this. One of the things as a moral theologian that's always very exciting is um, no pronouncement coming about anything that's just happened. Very important because it gives us time to think. Trans identity is becoming, is just coming to the radar of so many Catholic institutions. What if we instead took time to study and encounter it before issuing documents and declarations? What if we gave that time, okay? Second thing about endorsing versus prohibiting same-sex relationships. I know I'm going to sound like a broken record with this pastoral, with, with a pastoral approach to people, but I really do think that if people are in same-sex relationships, particularly if they have children, that they're bringing to church, given our numbers, we might <laughs> want to celebrate that. <laughs> we might want to say, okay, we know that we can't walk around at the gay pride parade, but what we can do is have you and your spouse bring the gifts to the altar in the middle of mass. We can give blessings over couples 
and ask people to identify within that. Creative ways to say around, to say about our existence that we recognize that people are in different positions with this teaching, but we want to honor the good that comes from that relationship. For people being in same-sex relationships, sometimes, or I think most times actually, really, being in a relationship with that person contributes to your overall spiritual well-being, that that person helps you come closer to God. What if we are honoring that and trying not to take a big stance on this marriage question, but simply to honor the journey that's, that these people are making? Maybe one day they will change their mind, but how do we even keep them in the community if we make people feel like they need to be segregated out of it? So I hope that helps a little bit, right? Like in the meantime, while we debate these moral questions, which I have not debated tonight, <laughs> right? What if we took a posture of appreciation of the good that is in these relationships as, as far as possible? I think that actually comes out of Pope Francis's thought about appreciating what is good in every irregular relationship, even if it doesn't approximate the normative ideal of a man and a woman in a sacramental marriage. So you mentioned um, the pride parades and not being able to participate, but there's these other things you can do. This is similar to that. Um, so I may want to support women in the country, but I can't join the Women's March because the first demand is about reproductive rights. Okay. I may want to work to make all gay and lesbian youth feel loved because of who they are, but I can't support the Trevor Project because they see same-sex marriage as equal to opposite-sex marriage. So, okay, so going along those lines. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then also from the other side then efforts that Catholics are participating in, like courage, are then ostracized from LGBTQ communities. And so how do you then engage when maybe there's not a dialogue from the other side as well? Sure. I mean, I think there's no perfect political realization of our moral beliefs. You know, when I think about the pro-life movement, right, I, I do think of it as an anti-abortion movement. I still wait sometimes to see the substantive commitment to death penalty abolition, right? Um, or to providing people with health care or other necessary things in their lives. I wonder if not, what are the costs of affiliating with that movement instead, right? I think we should weigh that, we should always weigh the lack of perfect alignment with our particular beliefs and ask ourselves, what good can I do in these organizations? And I asked myself, as a Catholic, where would Jesus be present? And I think that leads me to certain situations, certain groups of people, and, and away from others, not because Jesus doesn't love everyone, right? So All Lives Matter talks about. Jesus loves everyone. But that, at present, we have to pay attention to the experiences of people who have continuously throughout time endured marginalization, and that giving attention to this group actually brings everyone in line. I wonder if affiliating with that group for the purpose of what I see as giving them the preconditions for freedom of relationship with God is worth it, even if there are political positions that they take. And the other reason is that at the end of the day, everyone is taking positions that you might not personally agree with. And you started with numbers, so we're going to end with numbers. Okay. Uh, so the church's teaching on marriage and is clear, but it seems that those churches that have taken even more progressive stances, um, being inclusive of LGBTQ issues, so the Episcopalian Church, for example, seems to be declining in membership faster than the Catholic Church is. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comments on that? You know... I, I do not know. I think it's wise for me not to be within stone's throw of Christ Church giving uh, comments about the Episcopal Church. Um, it's hard to, I mean, they're so, I guess I don't think of same-sex marriages as like perfect marriages. I think that compatibility in the 21st century is issues we all have to deal with. And marriages end for any source of, for any number of reasons, and people might be leaving churches for a number of reasons, right? Like I'm not even sure. I tried to give a list to emphasize that this list is vast. It could be right, it could be wrong. It, in one case, it could vary by region, could vary by age. There's so many factors for this that 
I focused on one part because I said, if we use this lens, maybe this can shed light on other ways of thinking. Um, why people are leaving the Episcopal Church as opposed to the Catholic Church, one speculation that I have is that um, Catholicism is much more of ingrained personal cultural identity, I found. Um, like, I teach at a Catholic institution, and the numbers of Catholics is, like, extraordinarily high, and church is empty. So I'm like, okay, so, uh, like, you know, like, it's like, uh, I'm Catholic, I'm Catholic. I give, like, my first-year students, they tell me, I'm Catholic, I'm Catholic. And then, like, they have not been in a church. Like, COVID's a great excuse, by the way. Like, they haven't been since COVID, but really they haven't been since confirmation. Like, they've just, they're not, like, you know when the person says the old mass responses, remember the ones that used to, like, you know they have not been. Like, at marriages, this happens all the time. My friends getting married, they're saying all the wrong things because they haven't been to church since Obama was elected. So, like, there's not, like, you know, to me, I, I think... People just say they're Catholic, right? But also, what I think is interesting in the U.S. experience, too, is that we have an influx of Catholics coming across our southern border and being a part of our communities. I know that white Catholics' numbers are going down, but the reason why we retain roughly 25% of the Christian market in the U.S., when you use that term, is because of Hispanic and Spanish-speaking Catholics, people of color, coming from the South. So that demographic might also be a factor. But yes, I'm going to hopefully not get any stones thrown at me from Christchurch. <laughs> that means move, okay, yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Just because we're having some issues with the microphone. Dr. Ford, thank you so much for this conversation and really bringing out different points. I think to remember to look at the data, to look at where has segregation been problematic in the past and how do we look at those same questions going forward. And also just to have some humility. I think that's a good place for all of us to remember in terms of our faith and interactions. So thank you so much for joining us tonight and thank you all for being here tonight as well.